This is Miles Stanford, who greet each one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I trust that we might have a profitable time of fellowship and study together as we go into this series of tapes. These tapes were primarily made to open up this book a bit of uh, Principles of Reckoning. It's a very small book, and the subject of reckoning is a very extended subject. And so we hope to enlarge a bit and open up these things a little more fully so that we can know a little bit more how to reckon and what we're seeking to reckon and understand more fully these wonderful truths of growth. But I think before we get into the book, it might be good for me to share a few facts with you that you might get to know me a little better and also understand a little more fully why this book was written in the first place. I was born in Wheaton many years ago, over 50 years ago when it was a small, quiet town. And grew up there without any church or Sunday school background. Grew up to be a drunkard. I never heard the gospel, never heard about the Lord Jesus for the first 27 years of my life, living right there in Wheaton and in the Wheaton area. Those things can happen, and it happened to me. But as a poor, wretched drunkard, I began to realize something of my need, and of course that's what the Lord used to prepare me to put my trust in Him. I was witnessed to briefly in 1940 when I was 27, but I didn't understand what was being said. Uh, none of it seemed to get past my ears. I wasn't quite ready. So this pastor who had been seeking to win me to the Lord uh, stopped witnessing, but he kept on praying. And in that summer of 1940, I came under conviction of my sin and my need. But I didn't have any facts to go on about God. I did realize there was a God and that he was holy and pure. And I was realizing more and more fully that I was a lost sinner. And finally, in the fall of 1940, I came to the place where I uh, turned everything over to God and said that I would be on his side and uh, I would trust him. And then this pastor was able to open up the gospel to me and show me in the word what the Lord Jesus had done for me, who he was. And it was very simple for me to put my trust in him and receive him personally as my own Savior. And uh, it was a clear-cut conversion. My drinking problem was instantly erased, along with many other problems that uh, accompany such a life. And I want to make this very brief in, in the outline form for you, just to get an idea. <clears throat> and then maybe as we go along in the tapes, we can go into more detail in some of these things that the Lord has been doing. But two years later, I was drafted into the service and went over in, to Europe for two years. And while I was in the service overseas, people in the Wheaton area, the church there, began to write to me and seeking to help me. And they also would send me addresses of friends of theirs or relatives who were in that, in the European uh, field, asking me to write to them. Well, by the time I was discharged in 1945, I was writing, corresponding with around 200 Christians. 
Well, <clears throat> I realized then that I couldn't just drop this and that possibly the Lord had worked for me along these lines. And I continued to correspond and study during my first year out of the service. And then I moved to the New York area from Illinois, and I rented a room, and I stayed in that room for the next four or five years, uh, corresponding with different believers here and there, and studying. My heart was hungry to grow, and I was encountering uh, problems within, and I was encountering problems in corresponding with other Christians. And the Lord uh, used all this to cause me to dig deep into his word and to seek uh, the teachings of those who presented the growth truths. And I studied very definitely uh, such authors as Ruth Paxson and Andrew Murray, Ellie Maxwell, Hugo, William R. Newell, all of these different ones who presented pretty much the identification truths for our growth in Christ. Well, in 1951, the Lord gave me a wonderful wife, Cornelia, and she had similar heart hungers for growth and for working amongst believers. And during the next five, four or five years there in New York area, in the New York area, I continued the correspondence work, and Cornelia was a church visitor in a large down Presbyterian Church in Brooklyn, and we held uh, home meetings. We began to hold home meetings for hungry Christians, Christians who had been failing in their lives and service and who were hungry to grow. And we used, uh, as a sort of a textbook, we used uh, Ruth Paxson's Life on the Highest Plane, quite an undertaking. And then in 1955, we moved back to the Wheaton area. Very happy that the Lord worked that out. I didn't. I never expected that to happen. And he made it very clear and worked all the details out, and we moved back near Wheaton. And for the next seven years, we held many home meetings for hungry Christians, and the correspondence work continued. My wife worked as an executive secretary at Scripture Press, Enjoyed that work very much and the fellowship there. And during that time, I began sending out mimeographed letters to the mailing list, those that we were corresponding with, uh, containing the overall truths that we were sharing in the personal letters. We would send these letters out every other, every other month, and I mimeographed them in green ink, to signify growth, we call them the green letters. Well, that series went on six letters a year for three years until we had a series of 18 letters. And that, that ended after we moved out here to Colorado Springs. We moved out here in 61. And not long after we were here, that series ended. And uh, quite a few friends suggested that we make a book out of the series, put them in booklet form. Well, the Lord gave us freedom to do that, so very effortlessly, uh, naturally, we had a, a book all of a sudden. Well, in my small faith, I felt that the best thing to do would be to have about 2,000 printed, enough for those that we were in touch with that we had been sending the mimeograph letters out to, and a few others. <clears throat> and a friend had to talk me into having at least 5,000 done for the first printing, which I finally did. Well, those, that first printing didn't last very long. People began writing in for copies. And as you may know, they're still asking for copies three years later, four years later. And 
a year or so ago, Dr. Epp asked if he might use them in, as a supplement to his radio broadcast, and he changed the title from Green Letters to Principles of Spiritual Growth, and I believe that he has used about 100,000 to date. We gave away our first 15,000, and then we had to begin charging for them, and a few days ago I ordered the sixth printing for our use so that we have about we'll have about 30,000 in print which is uh, all told is quite a far cry from my little 2,000 that I thought would be plenty to begin with and we are amazed at the way the Lord continues to spread the green letters and they're actually designed to introduce more fully these growth truths for Christians as centered in our identification with the Lord Jesus. I trust that each one of you has read the book and studied it. We uh, we do have a series of tapes that are pretty much parallel with the Green Letters, a 10-hour series, but uh, this series of tapes for the Reckoning book is going to be right chapter by chapter right through the book, geared closely to the book. And I would say that in our going through this Reckoning book, this series of tapes, that it would be best if each one of us had already studied the green letters as preparation, as groundwork, you might say, for this uh, this other book that we're in now which is quite a bit more difficult I might say than the green letters which is one of the main reasons why we're making this tape to help open the book up make it a little simpler well we've been uh, we've had a wonderful time here in Colorado Springs we found that this area is uh wide open, you might say, for so-called deeper truths. Doesn't seem to have been much of that teaching out here, and Christians are quite hungry. All this seems to be quite new to them in our personal contacts. And of course, we are continuing the correspondence work, which has been growing through the years, slowly. And Cornelia is now here working with me, the work became too much for uh, too much for me to handle alone. <clears throat> She's having a wonderful time uh, taking part in the work, and she has some classes of her own in the area and in, at the church. So we're we're having a, a great time sharing, working together, and sharing with others these truths that the Lord opens up. Well, now if we can open up our little book here, Reckoning, <clears throat> you'll notice that there are three points here on the first page, three key points, you might say, to Reckoning. They're uh, points that are necessary for any development, any progress in having to do with the truth of the Word. Uh, we might say, first of all, that uh, reckoning has to do with uh, faith. It's really another word for faith. Reckoning means to count upon something, count upon someone, to count upon the truth. I reckon that is true. I count that that is true. I believe that that is true. So when you think of reckoning, you might think of counting upon something. You might just simply think of faith. Well, faith, uh, to be faith at all, has to have uh, knowledge before it can function. We have to know the facts before we can exercise faith in those facts and put our trust in them. So knowledge really comes before faith before we can reckon. 
And then, of course, in this matter of counting upon the truth for growth, then then we enter the principle of time, because uh, God teaches us the truth and reveals the truth to us, and then he waits for us to believe and to trust him about that truth, the specific truth, and then we have to wait for him to take us through circumstances and places and situations and work out the details in order to make these truths become a part of our daily life. It takes a lot of time. And during that time, often a Christian's faith will waver and he'll wonder, well, uh, maybe I'm not really trusting God about these truths and maybe these truths aren't working and maybe they're not for me. And if he doesn't understand the principle of time, he's going to be frustrated so that we're seeking to share with each one these facts of the way, the manner in which God works. We're not only sharing the facts about how to reckon, uh, we need to know how to do these things, but we also need to know how uh, God works them out once we begin trusting him. And it's a great comfort, and it's it's an honor to the Lord, a great comfort to us and an honor to him when we understand how he works and that we're willing to wait in simple trust, rejoicing in him, resting in his truth, resting in him, while he works out these facts that we're believing. So knowledge comes first, then on the basis of what we know, we believe, and on the basis of what we believe, God, in time and in his own way, uh, begins to make these truths, real, and experiential in our daily life. <clears throat> now over here on page two, we uh, are mentioning the identific- our identification with the Lord Jesus. Now this truth is uh, woven all through the New Testament as a principle. It is centered in Romans 6. It most clearly presented there as a doctrine, as a truth. Uh, Most of it is gathered up there for us to see on one page, you might say. And the Christian who is hungry to grow and who is to make uh, any spiritual advance toward maturity, he must come to know these truths concerning his identification with the Lord Jesus. And uh, these truths are set forth in the green letters, and they're set forth in this book, Reckoning. And we're going to elaborate upon them and uh, look at them from different angles. And we're going to take our time about it and make sure that each one of us understands the truth of our individual personal identification with the Lord Jesus in his death at Calvary unto sin and in his risen life in glory today, right now. Each one of us is identified with him in his, where he is in glory. That's the source. He's the source of our Christian life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And every believer, whether he realizes it or not, is living in heaven. That's where our life comes from. We're existing and we're sojourning and we're camping and we're serving here in this lost, sin-sick world. But the source of our life and the place that we abide and really live is in our risen Lord Jesus in glory right at the right hand of our Heavenly Father. And this is the truth that Christians need to realize. See, and this is what we're going to share and think about and study about. I might say a word about our study meetings. In our experience through the years in holding home meetings, church meetings, and conference work, we found that it's best not to 
gather together in a group for study uh, too often, too quickly, uh, one meeting after the other. <clears throat> that might be hard for you to take and uh, might not want to hear that because a hungry heart wants to meet every evening, wants to keep the meeting going all the time. But these truths are deep and there are they are uh, it takes time to for them to open up to our understanding and our hearts the lord doesn't hurry plus the fact that that which we learn as we study the facts that we learn the lord wants to work them into our lives and he does that mainly through our everyday experience in our home or at work or wherever it is, at school, so that it's really best to meet every other week. We, uh, some of our meetings, we used to hold only once a month, so that the truth gained during the meeting would uh, be gained, uh, mentally gained, uh, understood in our minds, which is absolutely necessary, would become a part of our life or begin to become a part of our life as the Lord deals with us and works with us and takes us through things uh, in between meetings. So that if we're meeting too often and studying too much, um, we're gathering a lot of head knowledge, but our experiential experience of these truths that we're learning is lagging far, far behind if we're meeting too often. So it's really best to meet maybe every other week to give the Lord more time to take us through things and and uh, give us more of the experience. It isn't that <clears throat> our experience is going to keep up with what we learn. Actually, the hungry-hearted Christian, his knowledge is far, always far ahead of what he is, uh, what he has in his daily life. But <clears throat> there's no use in exaggerating that and making it uh, making the problem all the worse by studying as a group far in advance of what we're experiencing. It's best to seek to keep more at God's pace. Then there's less frustration and there's more reality in that which we're studying. <coughs> In this matter of um, our identification, which we'll go into later on in later chapters, verse by verse, we come to realize that what happened to the Lord Jesus at Calvary happened to each Christian. That God identified us with him when he died out of the realm of sin. And when he rose, um, and when he ascended, that every Christian, everyone who would ever believe in him was identified with him and is in Christ, arisen with him, that our life is hid with Christ in God right today, source of our Christian life. And we're, we're going to go over these things and get them clear, cleared up. Before a Christian can actually and intelligently reckon by faith, he's got to know these truths. He must know what happened to him in Christ and where he is in Christ before he can count upon the facts. And as we count upon the facts, we're exercising faith in what God has done, and that gives the Holy Spirit freedom to make those truths experiential in our daily lives. We live and we grow by faith, faith in the facts. One of the things that's hard for a Christian to understand when he begins to reckon on his position in Christ and reckon upon his identification with the Lord Jesus, he he may experience some of the very truths right away. There might be uh, more or less a crisis in his life, and he may be overjoyed at the new freedom that he experiences uh, from believing in these things. But then there is always a time not too far distant where he loses much of that experience. 
and that's part of God's pattern. But if he doesn't understand what's happening, he becomes quite upset and wondering, well, maybe these truths aren't real after all, or maybe they don't work for me, or maybe they're not for me. And there's a good deal of frustration often. But it's a pattern. It's the way God works. Now, if you remember uh, when you were saved, actually that was your first experience of reckoning, that you began to realize that you were a lost sinner, and in some means or other, the Lord Jesus was presented to you, and you finally placed your trust in him. You received him as your own personal Savior. You were reckoning upon the truth of the word. You were reckoning upon him. You were counting upon him. You were exercising faith in him. That was your first experience in reckoning. And God was training you even then for a reckoning of these deeper truths for growth. Although most Christians don't didn't realize that at the time, but the pattern set in that when we were first saved, there was a we were full of joy and full of the love of the Lord and uh, eager to serve Him, out and out for the Lord Jesus, and uh, seeking to win others, and all of this uh, new life was flowing out. Uh, it was a wonderful time, <clears throat> but then it wasn't too long, maybe a few months or maybe maybe several years when there was a time of declension, when we thought, well, we're backsliding and uh, we lose our joy and we lose uh, much of our love for the Lord and we become more and more self-centered and we seem to sink back in many ways uh, back to where we were before we were saved. We can't understand this. Well, there are many reasons for it, but it's still part of God's pattern for each one of us that... uh, when we're first saved, it's all so clear and wonderful and new, and we think we know it all. And so uh, we busy telling others about him and uh, serving him, seeking to serve him in many ways, very busy for him. And that begins to cut into our feeding upon the Lord Jesus. It begins to cut into our interest in the Word. And much of our use of the Word is uh, often just for service and uh, seeking to win others and uh, to work out little messages and testimony and all, and we're not uh, growing, we're not feeding, we're working. Well, that's all right, but it's not, it has to be uh, related. Uh, Working and uh, serving must uh, spring from growth, uh, from uh, strength in the Lord, which has to come first. But we, uh, at the beginning, we get this reversed, and we're out in front working for the Lord more than we are holding back and uh, feeding and being prepared. While the natural result is uh, what we call often backsliding, it isn't really backsliding, or we lose our first love. Well, it actually happens, but yet it's it's God doing this. It, it's God God's uh, principle of uh, dealing with us because he wants us to come to know more about ourselves and what we can't do. We have to learn some of our weaknesses as Christians because the Lord Jesus' strength is made perfect in our weakness. Then if we don't fail and uh, if he doesn't put us in situations that are too much for us, then we never realize our weakness and we're out constantly working for the Lord and he has to hold back and wait and until we run out of steam and uh, come back and begin to learn to rest and abide in him and let him work through us. You, you, you possibly remember the statement was made by possibly Hudson Taylor, or at least some missionary leader, who said that he originally went on to the field to work for the Lord Jesus, and after time he failed and he came home and then when he was ready to go back out again, he, his attitude was a little different. Uh, he was was going out that uh, he might work for the Lord Jesus, but uh, depending upon the Lord Jesus to help him. And then it was failure again. So the final time, much, much later, when he went out again to the field, why his attitude was, Lord, I... I can't do it, and uh, I'm going out in complete dependence upon thee to 
do whatever you want through me, which is the right attitude, but it takes time to learn that. And most of it is learned through failure in our getting in the way and our seeking to do what only the Lord can do. And not I, but Christ's life is where he's seeking to take us. So there is a pattern, and the pattern is you start out strong when you see the truth and you are very zealous for the Lord, and then the Lord causes us to fail. The pattern is success at first in, in any realm of truth, see the truth quite clearly, but then there's failure, and then uh, the faith begins to waver as to just how true that truth is and how much of it is for us. So that's the pattern. And most Christians experience that pattern when they're in their initial beginning of the Christian life. Well, later on, when Christians are farther along, 10, 15 years, and they begin to learn something about their identification with the Lord Jesus and begin to learn something about the growth truths and uh, begin to seek to know something about how to reckon, then uh, they're entering into the same pattern, but they seem to forget it and not realize it. They learn about their identification with the Lord Jesus. They see it quite clearly. They begin to reckon and count upon it and uh, begin to experience something of that truth, a new freedom in their Christian life, new freedom from self and the world and uh, sin, and a new realization of the Lord Jesus as their life. And that may go on for some time, and there's a lot of service seeking to um, share these truths with others and uh, working for the Lord along these deeper lines. But then comes the failure again, and the Christian uh, often seeks to struggle to keep up a front and to maintain his testimony and uh, seek to keep this thing going. But the Lord is relentless about it. He, he makes sure that there is failure here too. And that uh, many Christians today are finding out about identification and many Christians are getting into it a ways, and then there comes a setback. And that's another reason why we've written this book, Principle of Reckoning, is to help the Christian understand what's happening and why this is happening. And that's what we want to talk over in these chapters, is how to get through this initial setback, why it's happening, and... Uh, what the Lord is doing is so that we can uh, go on with the Lord and become established in these identification truths. So there, actually the, there are two experiences of this pattern. When we learn of the truths of justification and when we learn of the truths of identification. And many Christians become quite uh, despondent quite shaken as they begin to lose out in their reckoning. And I've heard many, many Christians say that, uh, as we've m noted here on page 4 at the bottom, uh, well, I tried Romans 6, I tried these identification truths, but they didn't work for me. Well, dear friends, in the first place, we don't try truths. We don't uh, take a hold of truths and see if they'll work and hope to Ring, ring some benefit out of them. It, it, that isn't, of course, the correct attitude. That isn't the basis upon which the Holy Spirit will work at all. Um, God has his plan and purpose for each Christian, and he knows exactly how to bring the Christian into the reality of this plan of his. And the attitude of the Christian, through failure and through finding out what he is in himself, finally becomes, well, Lord, if it's going to be done at all, you're going to do it. And uh, beyond that, it becomes, well, Lord, uh, I know that you can do it, even in me. And the reason the Christian knows that God can do it even in him is because he finds out in the Word that God has already done it. God has already established him in the Lord Jesus. 
He's already worked each of our Christian lives out in the Lord Jesus, who is our life. And uh, we begin to see and understand more about the finished work, that our life is complete in the Lord Jesus already, has been all along and that the whole process of the Christian life is the outworking of that finished work into our daily walk. So our confidence is, uh, grows, becomes strong in him because we know he can do it because he's already done it. And that we, as we grow, as we count upon the truths and understand the truths and find out more about ourselves in Christ, we experience more and more of the finished work that God is giving us in our daily walk. Well, that's a wonderful faith strengthener to realize what God has already done. I remember years ago, so hungry to grow and uh, young in the Lord, and uh, the Lord was taking me through a lot of failure where I was finding out more and more about myself. And the more I saw of myself, the more I was convinced that, uh, well, God can never make anything out of me as a Christian. The Lord Jesus will never be able to manifest himself in and through me to any extent at all because of uh, the intolerable burden of self that I was encountering. But the Lord kept me in the Word and he kept revealing more and more of my position in the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus as my life. And I began to realize that he can do it because he has done it. He's done it in Christ. And as I trust him, he'll make that finished work, that reality in Christ, experiential in me. And that is what Christian growth amounts to. The, the, you might say the prefabricated work, uh, the completed, heaven-made Christian life already, and uh, it is given to us almost piece by piece, fitted together in our daily experience as we grow. It's a very comforting fact. It enables us to rest in him and wait upon him as he does it and to exercise faith in the fact that he will do it. And that's the attitude that he needs for the Christian to grow. So we must remember that if we see, if we begin to learn about and see this pattern, that will hold us still. That will, enab will enable us to trust him through all the process that is required for our growth. Now we can turn over to page 6 in our first chapter. I want to talk to you a little bit about this principle of need. Another principle that's very important for our Christian growth and development. When we first, for instance, see this truth of identification, first begin to taste something of it and realize something of it, that the Lord Jesus is our life and that uh, at the cross he has already dealt with the self-life. <coughs> And we begin to count the self-life as crucified, and we begin to count ourselves alive unto God in Christ. And we begin to know something of these truths in our walk. <clears throat> less and less domination of self and sin, and more and more uh, manifestation of the Lord Jesus in our life. More of the not I, but Christ life. It's also real and uh, wonderful to us that we feel, well, now this is it. We're already in and uh, uh, well on the way. But what God does, he gives us this uh, realization and taste of the truth at the beginning 
so as to um, hold us to it while he takes us through the requ required development process to make it all an actual part of our lives. We first see it and begin to understand it, but that isn't actually possessing or being possessed by all of this truth. So what happens is we begin to lose out in the experience because God wants us to believe these truths whether we experience them or not at first. He wants to anchor our faith in what the Word says about it all. Anchor our faith in the truth and not have our faith uh, depending uh, to a large degree upon our experience or what we're experiencing in the truth. The faith must first be anchored in what the Word says whether there's any experience of it or not. That's what he's seeking to do. So he, he often has to take some of the experience away so that we'll believe him just because he said it. That's where our faith has to be anchored, in the Word, just because God has said it. Well, <clears throat> how does God get us to function and to exercise faith that firmly? Well, he has a very normal and wonderful way of doing that for us. He does it through the principle of need. Now, why why is a Christian interested in reckoning in the first place? Why is he interested in, identific in identification truth at all? Well, he's, he's interested in them because he has a need. He is saved and he's been working for the Lord and he's finding that much of his service has failed and much of his personal life has failed and he realizes that he needs deeper truth and, and a closer abiding and uh, walking in the Lord Jesus in order to function, in order to become a mature Christian and to become fruitful in his service. The failure in the early years has created the need that has driven the Christian on into the truth for growth. That's why many Christians that we encounter are not the least bit interested in these identification truths. They're not really interested in growth. is because they do not yet realize personal need in their Christian life. True, they all probably have acute needs that we can see or others can see, but they themselves are not yet aware of these needs or they haven't yet come to the place of facing up honestly to their needs. And until a Christian is aware of his needs, he certainly is not going to reach out for God's answer to those needs. And that's why so very few Seemingly, so very few Christians in any one church or any one group are, so very few of them are ready to go on with the Lord, basically because they have not really encountered their personal needs as Christians. Uh, many are still going on in their first flush of the Christian life and uh, still working hard for the Lord and still making a go of it, and the time hasn't come yet where the Lord causes them to fail so that they'll begin to learn more about self, which in turn causes them to hunger to know more about the Lord Jesus, to get to know him better. So the Christian who is aware, keenly aware, overwhelmed, you might say, by his needs, is the Christian who is best qualified to grow. And he's a very Christian that, uh, at first at least, he, he's, he feels that he's least qualified to grow. Uh, he's becoming aware of self to such an extent that he feels that he'll never grow, that he's made a complete failure of the Christian life, can't serve the Lord, he can't live as a Christian, his family life or her family life is uh, becoming more and more pathetic and uh, more and more of a problem. 
and uh, many Christians are about ready to give up. But that's the very time that the Lord steps in because he's been generating these needs which are required, absolutely required, for the Christian to reach out and appropriate and uh, rest in the truths that are needed to answer those needs. So it's something to praise the Lord for when we become aware of how needy we are. Because through that means, the Lord Jesus becomes all and uh, we realize our nothingness. We realize that in ourselves we are nothing, but that in the Lord Jesus, he is everything. And that, that of course, is exactly what we need to learn. So the principle of need is all important. And only God, only God can bring these needs about. We can't manufacture our own needs. It's true that most of the needs that God brings about in our lives, he does it through our personal failure. He allows us to be headstrong and rush into situations that we can't handle. He allows us to be stubborn. He understands all of that. He uses it uh, for his ends. He uses our worst points to develop his best points in us. He's not against us. He's for us. He understands all about us, and he simply allows situations and circumstances to arise where we'll find out personally what he has known all along. And he's understood all along, and he cares about us all along. And he, he wants us to find out. And he doesn't let us find it out all at once, because if we ever really came to know what self is like uh, all at once, we, we couldn't stand it, we couldn't take it. It'd be too much for us. And any Christian who's been along the Christian life long enough to know something of self will admit this, that uh, there's nothing worse than self. Nothing at all. And uh, it's the very thing, the very element that drives us to the Lord Jesus, that God uses our worst points to, as the best factor we have for growth in Christ. It's one of God's paradoxes. He does things upside down. He does things backwards according to our thinking. He brings life out of death and he brings success out of failure. And he brings uh, Christ manifests the Lord Jesus in our lives through our realization of uh, the awfulness and sinfulness of self. Well, that's what God is doing with each one of us. That's why we're meeting together. That's why we're hungry to grow. That he takes us from the gospel stage, the milk of the gospel stage, and takes us into the straw meat of the word, the milk of the gospel early stages of our Christian life is absolutely necessary, the birth truths, the basic foundational truths, but then we have to come along and be taken into the truths that have to do with growth. And uh, at first it seems like awfully strong meat and awfully difficult to understand, but as we look to the Lord and depend upon Him and continue on studying, discussing these things and all, that they become clearer and clearer. They become just as clear as the early justification truths. I often marvel at the way God worked with my wife and worked with me through the years in coming into these truths, and probably you are experiencing much the same thing. That you go along and <clears throat> things become very difficult, and you seek to struggle and keep your balance and produce 
but it doesn't do any good. And then uh, at the proper time, at the Lord's time, His timing, He'll place you in touch with someone or there'll be some book or you'll hear a message <coughs> that will take care of that need. That will take care of that particular hard time. And he never fails. He doesn't work fast, but he he's very thorough, and he never fails. Uh, many years back, I was uh, was in England for a year, having a very difficult time in my Christian life, trying to work for the Lord, and no one would respond. And the Lord put me in touch with some dear mature Christians they realized that I was a young Christian and realized what a, something of what I was going through and they put me in touch with Andrew Murray's books which I had not known anything about they gave me I believe it was Murray's Abide in Christ which was far too advanced for me at the time and yet of course there is much in it that spoke to my heart and I've read that book several times and I wasn't too concerned about what I couldn't understand but I was very thankful for what I could understand in other words, I, I took what I was ready for and uh, gained the benefit of it. I didn't worry too much about what I couldn't understand. And th that might be your case even in the green letters or even in this book here. Uh, there may be much that you don't understand you're not ready for, but the thing to do is to be thankful for what you are ready for, which in turn will prepare you for the more mature teaching. While the little that I learned from Andrew Murray back there was what I needed then. And of course that prepared me for more of what Andrew Murray had to say in that book and in many other books. And through the years we have used and been very thankful for Andrew Murray and his ministry. He's written about, I think he wrote about 60 books. All of them were a devotional type book for growth. They're probably, they were all written originally in uh, Afrikaans, in Dutch, Afrikaans. But I think there are around 36 of his books in English. And we have 35 of them gathered through the years. I think in this country now, there are probably about 20 of those books that are in print, 15 or 20 of his main books. And as you search around in some of these second-hand stores, sometimes you can find some of the older Murray books that have been long out of print. Well, he's, he's, he's been a great help to many Christians, of course, through the years, Andrew Murray. But the thing is that even the wonderful Andrew Murray books uh, don't mean much to the Christian who is not aware of his need. And that's why, of course, many Christians are complaining, well, I, I just don't, it's it's a chore now for me to even study my Bible and to pray, and, uh, and I'm not much interested in church. It's just uh, all labor and uh, difficult. Well, the main reason for that is that the the needs have not built up enough. That the, the the keen awareness of one's spiritual needs are uh, is not there because the hungry, thirsty. Christian finds uh, food and water, food and drink, and uh, gold in the Word of God. And another thing, 
about this subject is that many Christians who are hungry to grow and who are thirsting are studying their Bible in a general way <clears throat> and they're not getting down into the areas where the food is. We are to, as Christians, we are to feed upon the Lord Jesus who is our life, who is the bread of life. And uh, the needs, the actual growing needs of a Christian are not going to be met, for instance, in the Old Testament, not even going to be met in the Psalms, I might say. There's comfort in the Psalms and there's teaching in the Psalms, yes, but when it comes to the Christian's spiritual needs and his hunger, they are designed to be met in the source of his Christian life, in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's a mistake that many Christians are making. They're not really concentrating upon the food that they need in the bareness of their daily life. It's true that we must study the word broadly, overall, from Genesis to Revelation. It's, it's the thing that the Christian should do. And he does this in his overall study, and he does this as he attends church, uh, his church, his pastor, if he's in a sound church, his pastor ministers the word throughout the year and the Christian is gaining an overall uh, the overall understanding of the word but in the Christian's daily feeding he it is best for him to concentrate upon the Lord Jesus Christ that I may know him and seek out the Lord Jesus mainly in the gospels and of course in the epistles and get to know him and fellowship with him and that study and that fellowship will be the main thing that will develop the Christian life that will cause growth that will cause stability and maturity as we get to know him personally get to know our relationship to him and our position in him then there will be true growth. I think this is important for the Christian to realize. Then, of course, <clears throat> our thinking in these things must be adjusted to his timing. Uh, our need is imminent. The Christian feels that he must have the answer now. And he rushes to the Lord and he rushes to other Christians and he, he wants help now. Well, it isn't that the Lord holds back, but it is that God is working not only for time but for eternity. And he does not work superficially. He does not work in any shallow way. He goes into the very depths of our life and he works at a slower pace than we usually seek to have him work. And it's very important to let him be God and to adjust our thinking to his and to be willing to wait while he works out our personal needs, the answer to our personal needs and be willing to wait. And that gives him time to do his work right. And in the long run, it will be much better than uh, <clears throat> begging God and insisting the, the, that God give us what we need right now. Because there are things that he is seeking to teach us, and he can only teach these things to us while there is a tension in our lives of our needs and our realization that only God can do what we can't do. These situations are required for us to learn. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> throughout this study now in this book, we'll be talking about the principle of knowledge to get to know him and get to know the truth 
We will be talking mainly about the principle of faith and our reckoning upon the truths that we're learning. And we'll be talking about the principle of time, the time that God takes to make these truths real in our daily walk. We'll be talking about the principle of need, the needs generated in our lives that we think are the worst things that could possibly happen to us, whereas uh, you come right around to realize that they're the very best things that God could have done for us. And we get to know something about his principle in Romans 8, 28, that uh, he personally is working all things together for our good, for our spiritual development, that he might uh, work out his purpose for each one of us in our daily life. That's why he's working all these things together. And uh, the wonderful fact that he's working them together, that he doesn't do each thing uh, as a unit, meet each need as a unit, but that he may work something in our life today and then make it work together with something that happens to us 20 years from now. And then we get the full benefit of these factors that he worked together. And of course, he has everything geared, everything in this universe, everything is all geared together and working together. But they don't all work at once. There are many things that happened in our lives uh, back far long before we were Christians that he's using to link together with things that are happening today in our Christian life. There are things that happen concerning us uh, years and generations before we were born having to do with our forebears that God uses very distinctly in our personal character and makeup today. Not only in our Christian growth, but in our Christian service. And we, we must realize this, that uh, we were, uh, our relationship to the Lord Jesus was established uh, <laughs> before the world began and that God has all of this geared from eternity to eternity for each individual born-again believer, for you and for me, that every atom in this universe is linked to his purpose for each and every one who ever has and ever will be born again. That's the kind of a God we have. That's the kind of purpose he's working out. And it's all centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, friends, we must stop now. We'll go to work a little more definitely in the Word in our next chapter. I trust that we might prayerfully meet together each time we gather and that the Lord Jesus might be free to do his work in us between meetings and during our little meetings. Our Father, we thank thee for this brief time together. We pray that each heart might be patient as we go over these many things, realizing that there is much for each of us to learn and that all of these things are fitted together for our life and for our service. We thank Thee for each heart who is yearning for growth in Thee. We thank Thee for Thy Word that we can dig into, depending upon the Holy Spirit to teach us. We thank Thee for all that Thou hast done for us in the Lord Jesus and how Thou hast placed us in Him and how He is waiting to manifest himself more and more fully through each one of us that the Lord Jesus might be glorified and that in that way he might glorify thee in thy name so we praise thee for thy sovereignty we praise thee for thy faithfulness to each one of us 